15. <laughs> Dress, dressed up beyond recognition. And assembled here in Gates Auditorium. It, it's an occasion we will remember forever. <laughs> Wherever we are, we're there. Wherever we are, we're there here to recognize the outstanding motivation and diligence of these award winners and the legendary departed teachers who laid the foundation of human ecology at the beginning of time. <laughs> Craig, Dan, Dick, and Bill were eminent thinkers and scholars who stepped back from their own professional trajectories to create an educational institution such as had never before existed. With an unwavering focus on students as individuals, purposely kept so small and open that it is affected by every one of us and reshaped by every generation that passes through. They would have felt great pride in the accomplishments of these students, but they knew also that personal success is meaningless without the context of a shared community that is both the inspiration and the audience for creative work, which you could see in Joe's concert last night with Max, Sean, Emily, and Coop which levitated us from week 10 to cloud nine <laughs> in Ben's production of Othello, featuring the Moorish general Sophie Cameron, which maintained COA's tradition of drop-dead Shakespearean tragedy. No doubt, no doubt Shakespeare's personal hell would be having to watch the eternal, monotonous productions of his work. But, if he saw Ivar Harbour, he would have been very much interested in the rewrite and casting of this play. <laughs> then, the inimitable Genoa brought us The Librarian's Nightmare, <laughs> from which Jane and Trish are still gluing the pages back into the rear book collection. <laughs> These projects are brilliant and singular achievements, but they are also deeply collaborative and every one of them proves the inseparability of our creative and collective lives. All year, the faculty has struggled over the so-called balance between professional development and group participation when we could have learned from our own students that the difference is an illusion, that individual and communal success are not in conflict, but one and the same. The early teachers celebrated in today's awards, risked their careers and their sanity to come to a college located at that time above the Arctic Circle, <laughs> whose, before climate change, <laughs> whose, whose financial horizon was the end of the month, and whose map was a crumbling mansion rented for one dollar a year. They started at absolute zero and collectively built something that then burned to the ground. <laughs> and, and an outpouring of solidarity and regeneration was built again. No doubt the reason we're huddling in this temporary structure <laughs> is to commemorate our sudden homelessness after the fire of 1983, 30 years ago. Why else? Both times, we overcame total uncertainty through a, a mutuality of respect and trust in COA's mission, in one another, and in a community that drew its principles from nature. The equal dignity and importance of every living organism and the notion of evolutionary development through testing our ideas in the actual world. Those were the hunter-gatherer days of COA before our settled agricultural era. <laughs> we occupied an abandoned seminary and re-inhabited it with a shamanistic island cult. <laughs> now, it has become a settled ecclesiastical hierarchy <laughs> consisting of 30 professors, five lecturers, eight deans, 150 chickens, 14 ducks, three pigs, and 38 sheep. Four of them working on their senior projects. 
<laughs> Back then, we made no distinctions. We had no Phi Beta Kappa, no freshmen, no sophomores, no associate professors, no professors, no publisher, no parish, no chairs, no deans, no negotiations, no zero course terms. We were completely transparent, which made it difficult to find each other, <laughs> especially in the dark. We took knowledge to be undivided with no majors, no departments, which forced us to leave the safety of specialization and discover a common language. It was a hybrid of New England transcendentalism and Chairman Mao. We had no athletic teams, no fraternities, no dead animals on your lunch plate. And as for sex, if you were attracted to someone, you had to form a committee and bring it to ACM. If the minutes weren't challenged, the following Wednesday, you could take the next step. But generally, by then, the impulse had dissipated. And the moment was gone. We are always so proud when the children of early graduates come back to study at COA. But they weren't manufactured here. Dan Kane was our first lawyer, but in the spirit of the times, as you've heard so eloquently from Ken, he also taught cosmology. It's been 41 years since his lecture on the precession of the equinoxes. I remember it as if it were yesterday. He was so good. Uh, and the North Star has moved eight-tenths of a degree so that an old alum walking back to campus at night from the Lompoc for the thirsty whale, navigating by the stars as we did before they built Route 3, <laughs> would find himself in a slightly different place, but not too different. COA began as a revolutionary democracy, and it still is. The Arab Spring and the Prague Spring their historical trivia compared to the faculty development group spring <laughs> of, of this very year. Most years, it's the hormone crazed students that revolt, but 2014 was ours. <laughs> All winter, a secret faculty hunter met Wednesday morning at 5.30 a.m. They were blindfolded, heavily caffeinated, and taken to an undisclosed location. They were totally anonymous, even to themselves. <laughs> the group included our most postmodern human and our most prehistoric Neanderthal, who had to be thawed out of the taxidermy freezer. But before you laugh, note that everyone in this room has 4% Neanderthal genes. We may be extinct, but we are very persuasive. <laughs> the Junta's manifesto of the Primo de Mayo, with its 13 non-negotiable demands, met organized resistance from the Gang of Eight. They fought with black clickers that appeared to be high-tech, till it was noticed they were old TV remotes from Ron Cass's house <laughs> that had no relation whatsoever to the vote count on the screen. <laughs> Civil war broke out. The anarchists regrouped and annihilated the junta in ACM 23 to 6 with 74 abstentions. <laughs> Excuse me, but the victors control the narrative. Two weeks later, when the gang of eight drugged and subdued, the junta prevailed unanimously due to superior lobbying and pit bull tenacity. Plus, they were backed by the Duke of Venice. <laughs> and anyway, everyone wanted to get to the dog policy. <laughs> we had dogs in classes in the beginning, first only as auditors. <laughs> but then we eventually gave two MPhils in canine ecology. And they are now among our most generous donors. <laughs> so remember, seniors, if animals can do it, so can you. <laughs> and 
according to Rich, there was a horse also, but it never took any of my classes. In my experience, horses have always avoided literature. Then, in a dark hour of our history, pets were banned. It was easier for a dog to get into Harvard than enter a building at COA. But change is our motto, and now dogs are welcome again, SAT optional, and just in time for the faculty, because after all that bloodshed, we needed to build solidarity. So led by an old union sideman from New Jersey, John Big Tuna Cooper, we asked for our first raise in 50 years. The administration said, well, a raise is no problem whatsoever, as long as we're not talking about money. So John said, what did you have in mind? And they said something along the lines of a therapy dog. And John said, what a generous offer. You mean a cute therapy puppy for each of us that we can hold during our reviews? And Andy said, no, not a dog each exactly. We get a $4 million shortfall. We were thinking of one central dog. And meanwhile, while their mentors were training for the tug of war, the seniors with nonstop creativity and discipline produced these amazing projects that had blossomed in every corner of the campus, literally, in some cases, like Zuri's bottle plants. The presentations all around us this morning were a feast of human ecology. We sipped a cornmeal offering with Adrienne's hummingbird. We gobbled an oyster with Lou the laughing gull. We strained with our front teeth through a sea of zooplankton. We assembled Lauren's soft serve dispenser and slurped 10 ice cream cones, then another 10 because we couldn't stop. We snacked on a handful of Victoria's spaghetti Lunch on Vietnamese chili tofu from the rooftop gardens of Bratislava, and then a to die for dessert of Logavore methyl mercury regurgitants <laughs> right from the Gulf of Maine. And the best part of it is, from now on, with the departure of our beloved take a break cashier Gina, from now on it's all going to be free. <laughs> you see, the COA staff members who feed us and wire us and plow us and mow us and organize our festivities, they are the day-by-day -day working and living embodiment of the human ecology that we theorize in class. Mary Harney was a B&G staff member for seven years. It seems only last month she was peering into my office while painting the window frames over at Witchcliffe, and tomorrow she will be the commencement speaker for 2014. There's the IT staff toiling invisibly down there in the hippocampus of the campus <laughs> who weave our limited individual brains that struggle to get through the day into one big collaborative brain that can change the world. One of these IT sorcerers is Sean Murphy, COA class of 2014. By day, Sean cultivates our reputation on the internet by night. When he's not playing bass with Joe, he's the author of Leviathan, a senior project novel the size of an adolescent blue whale, and, st <laughs> and still growing, from which he gave such a moving reading this morning. And this year, Sean becomes the first staff member ever to earn a bachelor's degree from COA. in 1979. Gosh, this is true, they're just the facts. If Sean is the creator of books, Genoa is the Terminator. He is the formerly red-bearded demon reader that every writer envisions in his dreams. Others can buy our books, but he's the one we want reading them. He licks the ink off the pages. 
then rips them out and rubs the blind paper into his flesh. He waltzes with the book, then walks all over it. He eats it and regurgitates it and has semi-consensual intercourse with it and gestates it and gives birth to it. Between Sean and Genoa, the literary cycle is complete. <laughs> Write it, publish it, bang it, birth it, nurse it, roll a joint of it, and light it on fire and smoke it to an infinitesimal roach. Human ecology is not a shelf title, it's a force of nature. Every one of these projects builds the college. Every one of them interrogates and deconstructs it to be built again. Thank you all for that, for that, for the projects. I have, um, as you can see, retirement is not exactly encouraged by COA. <laughs> but once in a while, someone manages to dig a tunnel from their office to the highway and breaks out. That's why Take a Break is now issuing plastic spoons. <laughs> Never again. But this year, one of our most respected colleagues is managing his escape. I'm thinking back to 1974. We were looking for an anthropologist with a main accent. <laughs> so he wouldn't scare the natives. Someone fluent in Quechua, in case any Quechuans came around. Plus a born musician who also shared 96% of their genetic material with a lobster. We know where the other 4% are from. It was a tough job description, but there happened to be an Elmer Beal impersonator in town. And since that time, he's done more than anyone to connect this school to its own seacoast habitat and the working state of Maine. El Elmer has given us street cred and indigenous cover, and in certain dark periods when the neighbors said, what the hell's going on in there? Someone would answer, if Elmer's mixed up in it, it must be okay. <laughs> Our zip code may be Eden Street, but at times we can be a touch pool of crustaceans, and I can't count the times Elmer has stepped in quietly as a mediator, healer, and diplomat to save us from ourselves. Elmer's teaching this coming fall, but this will be his last commencement, and we not only say goodbye to the outrageous class of 2014, but also to a deeply intuitive human ecologist and native of this island we call home. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.